Ready? Hit it! Hello everyone and welcome to Variety Theatre, the Spice of Life podcast with Maria Lovelady and Michael Allen Bailey, a podcast that aims to bring all things variety out of the wings and into the limelight. So without further ado, let's let's get get this show on the road. Coming up on today's episode... We chat to the loose producer of the Party Palace, Ali Wolf. We find out the meaning of Breesh. And would you go and see Bruno Mars Attacks? Well, you were probably one of the only ones. Although I didn't see it. Find out more about that later. So what have we been up to this week, Michael? Well, haven't we been up to this week? It's been another epic week of epicness, hasn't it? It has, it has. So we have been over to see Ali Wolf, who is the producer at the Clapham Grand. And we got a real all nooks and crannies tour, didn't we? Like, I think literally the only place we didn't go to was the roof. <laughs> and and there was a way of getting there. There was a way of getting there. We just weren't brave enough. To take us <laughs> onto the roof. So we went on a tour of the Clapham Grand. We saw everything. We definitely went places that we shouldn't have gone. And we spoke to Ali, who is so knowledgeable on the building and the history of Clapham Grand. And that's all coming up on today's interview. It's a fantastic chat, isn't it? Because he's so passionate. We love passionate people. Yeah, what Ali's really passionate about is bringing variety into the modern day. And speaking of passion, where else have we been this week? Oh, we have been to Brighton. We have, and we interviewed the fantastic author, Alison Child, who really graciously welcomed us into her home, and we stayed all afternoon. It was gorgeous, wasn't she? And we chatted to Alison all about her brand new book that she's got out, which is all about two variety performers, Gwen Farrer and Nora Blaney. Now, some of you might have heard of them already, some of you might not, but we've got a full interview with Alison coming up soon, where we really, really delve into the history of these two remarkable women. And Alison's written a beautiful book called Tell Me I'm Forgiven, which is all about the complicated history and relationship of these two wonderful lesbian performers. And Alison has an event coming up that she's going to tell us about now. Alison, tell us a little bit about it. On the 18th of November at the iconic Water Rats pub in Grays Inn Road, I am speaking as part of the British Music Hall Society's In the Limelight series about two extraordinary women that you have never heard of but who were household names in the 1920s. And they are Gwen Farrer and Nora Blaney and their lives encapsulate just about everything about life on stage in the 20th century and it's not to be missed. Alison flew all the way over from Greece just to record that and now she's flying back. Thanks a lot, Alison. (laughs) (laughs) Now, why don't we pick up on what happened in Brighton when we were there? Well, you had a tippy headron moment, didn't you? I did. It was terrifying for me, hilarious for Michael. Well, it was hilarious for both of us, but you were genuinely quite shaken by it, weren't you, afterwards? I was. So we went to Brighton to interview Alison, and we were just, you know, in Brighton, walking along the pier, having a wonderful day, and we thought, when in Brighton, what do you do? You get donuts on the pier. You get donuts on the pier, of course you do. So we were walking along, and we had our donuts, and we found these gorgeous little tables and chairs to sit on, didn't we? And looking over the water, Mm -hmm. we felt very sophisticated with our coffees and our donuts. And the next thing, what happened, Mike? We were dive-bombed. We were dive-bombed by what can only be described as two pterodactyls. (laughs) Seagulls the size of a Fiat 500 (laughs) dive-bombed us and stole... Us? Me? Me? (laughs) So before I even knew what had happened... Mike was taking a picture of me and I was just posing with my donut, giving it a little bit of a smile. And the next thing, I just felt this clip on my thumb. And I turn round and there is this humongous seagull in taking my the whole of my donut it's in its the mouth. Whole thing. It's the, the whole, whole thing. thing. And flew off with the whole of my donut. So my instinct was I just flung the donut at Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and this... Seagull then dive bombs Mike, and everyone around us is looking because, as you can imagine, we weren't quiet about the whole incident. No, absolutely not. And when we calmed down, which was quite a, quite a while after, quite a while after, and we thought, oh god, and that was the end of our donuts as well. Um, 
And we were really enjoying those donuts, it's worth saying. We like, were. We were so enjoying We them. were. <laughs> and um, yeah, although we have quite a big event coming up next week, so probably less donuts is the better. Yeah. <laughs> More about that next week. We can't wait to tell you more about that. But yeah, we, it was our um, our kind of 1960s horror movie moment, wasn't it? Oh, it was horrific. And then I just had all this like fight or flight blood running around my body. And we settled back down and we were like, oh, well, we should look at the pictures that we were taking before. And the picture, Mike has captured the moment that the seagull actually was just, just about, about yeah. to take it. And you can see that on our Instagram because it's hysterical. So then the hilarity just continued, didn't it? Because that was almost more funny than getting the donut stolen. No, it was. We were screaming down Brighton Pier, weren't we? Like, with laughter. Absolutely. Oh, we were just, we were in hysterics. We were. And uh, then we had to go to Alan, Alison's and be all professional and we didn't tell her about it. And... Um, actually having met her and just having a wonderful time hello Alison and we now know that you would have absolutely lapped that story up so that was our week and if you'd like to see that that picture that is literally one in a million then please head over to our Instagram and our Facebook and Twitter because it's all there to be seen Right then, let's get talking to Ali Wolf. He is the self-described loose producer of the Party Palace itself, the fabulous Clapham Grand. And after a massively, massively, massively in-depth tour of the Clapham Grand that we had with Ali, he sat down and spoke to us. And here's what he had to say. Hello, Ali. Hi. Thanks for having us at this beautiful venue. Absolute pleasure. We have just been lucky enough to be taken on a tour of the Clapham Grand by you. And it was just as stunning as we thought. And we saw all the, the secrets. And we're gutted we didn't bring a film crew. We are, because it was so gorgeous. But tell us about you and how the variety of theatre has spiced up your life. Well, I guess ultimately the reason why variety theatre has spiced up my life is because it's given me this further chapter in my career that I'm doing now, which is running the Clapham Grand. I, um, I, I'm just going to be completely honest with you guys. I'm not a variety theatre buff. I'm not from a theatre background. I'm not studious of this form of entertainment. I'm just a fan of putting on fun nights for people. And the process of doing that led me to work here. And, uh, you know, you should always do your research on what you do. And if you've got a historic building like the Clapham Grand at your hands, I was keen to find out more about it. And in reading it, I was fascinated about how many similarities there are between contemporary entertainment and Victorian entertainment and how I think it's very much misrepresented in contemporary culture and what people's perception of it is. And I thought it mm. was just really exciting to have somewhere that is purpose-built for entertainment and is still doing the same as it always has been, but modern version of it and not trying to pastiche it. It's, for me, it's like, it's Saturday night telly. Like, mm. you flick between channels for different types of programme and it's because you like different things mm -hmm. and what the venue does, it represents that in a live format. And we're not a niche venue. We don't just do theatre. We don't just do comedy. We don't just do this. We do a wide range of things that entertain a whole vast amount of people. But predominantly, our audience is young and they need something that's affordable for them to go to because they don't have the price point for West End Theatre. Mm -hmm. They're not as interested in niche cabaret or niche forms of entertainment. They want something that's loud, fun and silly that entertains them and is escapist from everyday life. And that is what this was originally built to do. And that's what mm -hmm. Variety originally was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily to educate. It was to entertain. It's only because it's all in black and white that people think it was highbrow and serious and Victorians were really serious people and they went... It, it wasn't stuffy, it was mm. accessible, it was young, it was fun, it was raucous, it was loud, it was probably actually un-PC, in mm -hmm. fact it was obviously un-PC, and you probably wouldn't have taken your, your mum to it now, but you would have taken your mum to it then, because tastes change and stuff. So, And for the and working classes as well, you know, primarily built for the it, working it, classes. It, exactly, like, no one, let's not be, let's not mess around here like no one can afford to go to the theatre regularly it's a once it's a one-off for most people unless you have that price point affordability yeah. so for us here it's like we do have customers that come every week we have customers that sometimes comes two or three times a week and the only reason they can afford to do it is because the price point is low enough for them to be able to do it it's 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 just about making something fun and accessible and entertaining it's not about pretending you are doing something that was victorian 
there's nothing I hate more. Well, there's obviously loads of things I hate in life. It's a very strong <laughs> comment. But <laughs> those nights whereby you have to dress as if you were of the era and the font is of the era. And it's like, well, that's all well and good, but I don't think modern audiences on a day-to-day basis want to be refed the past as it was in the past. They want something that's modern and talks to them on their level. But what I'm fascinated at is that the core root of all of it is from Victorian variety entertainment. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about some of the events that you hold here then that are a wide variety of things? Well, we, I think, I think people's, people's going out habits have changed. Like no one goes to mixed bill variety shows anymore on a regular basis. You know, the Royal Variety Show happens once a year and it's the biggest acts of every single format of entertainment on the same bill. And that's why it's a thing. On a regular basis, young people aren't going out going, oh, I'd love to go to an act where there was a trapeze act and then a comedian and then there was a contortionist yeah, yeah. and then there was a drag act and then there was a singer because that's not how people go out. And they don't really exist anyway, those they, kind of shows, they, do they? They do. And they, well, they don't, but if they do, they exist in small cabaret mm-hmm. bars where you've got that small audience. But yeah. for us, it's about the variety of entertainment over the course of a weekly or a monthly program. So for me, it's about making sure that when we look at my li- look at the listings of the venue, you've got a comedy night, you've got a drag night, you've got a film, a film night because we're also a cinema, mm-hmm. you've got a club night, you've got a live music event, you've got a boxing event, you've got all of these different types of events that are happening within seven days or sometimes even within the same day because we do three events on a Saturday sometimes. And it's... It's about showcasing the variety of entertainment within a calendar of events rather than within one show. What are some of the challenges that you face then as somebody programming that? Because we've just been taken on a tour of the space. Every single corner of the theatre is used for something. I mean, now we're sat by a pink uh, blow-up flamingo. So many costumes downstairs (laughs) that you use. We've seen the, you know, you've got your light-up dance floor. You've got the boxing ring. How do you manage to, to pull that off every week? I will. I mean, it's it's obviously challenging. But first of all, you're obviously talking to one one person. There's a lot of human beings that make the Clapham Grand tick, and it takes a wide group of staff that have all got different tastes that bleed into the programming mm. that makes it so um, multifaceted. The obstacles, seating plans, mm. room layouts, mm-hmm. like. Oh, to to shift from event to event to event with every event having a different layout a different format a different show a different tech team a different producer a different cast a different promoter it's communication is key yeah you've got to get on with everyone everyone's got their wants and needs you've got the building and the businesses wants and needs they've got to fit the two together you've got to have good working relationships you've got to have a good team that can facilitate it you've got to be prepared to move furniture Mm -hmm. a lot Furniture. Well, I was going to say, what is usually do you find is the more adaptable thing? The shows that come in or the space? It has to be the combination of both. Mm. You, you have to be able to. Um, I mean, this Sunday, I should have mentioned it. We had a. I don't know if you guys follow esports. Do you follow esports? No. Do you know what esports are? I don't. I wish I could say I did. But I don't. <laughs> have you heard of Fortnite? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, League, yeah. League yeah, of yeah. Legends. So basically, online gaming. Right. So. Online gaming is now so popular that when there is the final of a competition where people are playing teams, people are now wanting to watch that final yeah. in a live space. Right. So like you'd all come and watch England playing the football here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had it was the final of League of Legends and one of the teams in it are run by a company called Fnatic and they alongside us came up with the concept of putting on a live esports event as a viewing party mm-hmm. for people to come and watch. And we did it on Sunday. It was 8 hours long. The room's just full of people that love playing computer games, but they're watching a computer game that's being played by someone in a room somewhere on the other side of the world, yeah. playing someone else who's in a different country, and they're watching a computer game on a screen and cheering for it as if they were watching a football team yeah. or a boxing match. And they, for me, that that's one of the best things about the job because who would have thought that that was a thing yeah. <laughs> two years ago, yeah. let alone a thing that would find its natural home in a grade two listed Victorian theatre. Mm. But what's weird about it is it's the absolutely the perfect place for it because it's an auditorium that's built for people to watch something that's happening on the stage or with a screen because it then turned into a cinema. But also, surely entertainment is about progression and about modernisation. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more modern 
and people playing online gaming. Absolutely. And then to turn it into a live event in one of the oldest variety halls in the country, I was just like, this is exactly why I do it. This is yeah. what it's about. And it makes it social, doesn't it? Because what you've done there is brought a huge group of people together that would otherwise just be sat in their bedrooms yeah. or at home. And you've brought them all together. And who knows what friendships kick off, relationships. Mm-hmm. Like You I, find your people. I think that's it. And it, I think that ultimately is what makes entertainment timeless is the fact that it doesn't matter how divided we can become or how secular we can exist on social media and how disconnected in person we can be from each other to survive and nothing's proved that more than the last 18 months exactly we've yeah. all been able to get by but ultimately there is nothing more than human be- human beings want than to be put in the same room as each other whether they were exactly the same type of human or not and to socialize especially the younger you are because the younger you are, the more willing you are to make new friends. You probably aren't married yet. You want to m- make potential partners or mm. potential short-term partners or long-term <laughs> partners. I think it's it's the social, the creation of a social space that the Clapham Grand provides. It's a big mix mash of wonderful different types of people that is what makes it work. And it's what I love about it. And I think it's what separates it off from, like when you go to the theatre, it's made for older people. You're sat on your individual seat. Mm. You normally only go as a two. You mm-hmm. don't go as a group. Mm-hmm. It's a very sedate experience. You're focused on the show. You can't talk during the show. You, there's no bar in the venue. The bar's outside the venue. You can only get drinks in the interval. Yeah. It's very much geared towards the fact that your social life is already... Your social experience is established. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now you're having a private moment of entertainment in a group environment rather than a group entertainment in a public environment. And what the Clapham Grand does is it throws hundreds of people in a room sometimes thousands of people, and goes, you're going to have a bloody great time watching a great show, but you're also going to have a bloody great time with each other because yeah. you're all... You're all here? You're, you're all, all here, here for the same thing. I'm here for the same thing, and you get to know people, and you're going to have an amazing experience. And that, I think, is the... I've forgotten we've digressed from where we came from, but <laughs> I, that's the reason why I love doing it, is you can open up at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning to 400 people who are coming in to watch a computer game played live on the screen, but they're most excited about the fact they're going to be with 399 other people that love doing the same thing and they haven't had a chance to do that and you're giving them that environment to do it in. So do you like the phrase variety? I have a, I have a complex, I have a troubled relationship with it because I find it very hard to use it in a commercial way. It's mm. like you couldn't say to some, oh, you, to a 23 year old on the street, are you into variety? They're going to go, yeah, variety is a word that describes a combi- like an array of things. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Are you into variety? Mm-hmm. So it's a hard sell. Yeah, I understand it mm-hmm. what it is, but it's not a modern term, and I, mm-hmm. I, and it's very hard to get young people to to embrace that. I think, and I think you're fighting a losing battle if you try, because I just don't think it's a word that describes entertainment for anyone under thirty that hasn't got a knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. Um, we call ourselves the Clapham Ground, a palace of modern varieties, and that's more of a brand positional statement, I think, and it works as kind of like a, a statement piece, but it doesn't communicate that you're going to have a great drunk fun night to a 22-year-old. Mm-hmm. We'd be better off saying the Clapham Ground, a party palace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You see what yeah. I mean? But then if you call yourself the Clapham Ground, a party palace, are you going to get headline talent wanting to play a show? They're probably going to think you're just a nightclub. So it's mm-hmm. it's it's tricky. But yeah, to go back to your question... I understand the term variety, but I don't think it's something you can sell as an experience to young people, if you see what I mean. Like the word cabaret. Yeah. I struggle, yeah. With, I struggle with cabaret because it feels to me quite exclusionary and quite mm-hmm. highbrow and the only a set sector of society. God, mm-hmm. There's a lot of... That was accidents. some lovely alliteration. A set a set sector of society will do it and it's only accessible by it's only accessible by a set sector of society <laughs> um, or something that you need to like we could use that as the warm-up for our next show <laughs> we could accessible something that you society. need like a, a ticket for to go or to like a basement club and you need to be in the cool gang to and know you have that to be, it has to be very quiet and very ambient and there's somebody at a, on a piano and it's very sort of and you have personal to, be very well to the dressed. performer yes mm. exactly and your drink is going to be expensive and yeah. come in a really fancy glass and there's not going to be anywhere near enough of the drink in the glass because it it's going to be like a cocktail glass. And mm-hmm. We all just want fish bowls. And, spoons <laughs> and I think what I what I what I try and do here is take the take take that aspect of the show performance element of it, but make it accessible for young for younger people who aren't necessarily wanting that highbrow model because they're not quite 
there yet. Mm. If you see what I mean. But I think talking about the idea of it being highbrow, because we've talked a little bit off the mic about the history of the Clapham Grand, and that it wasn't highbrow, and that the audience weren't there to see highbrow entertainment. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of Clapham Grand? Because even though you say that you're not a, a connoisseur on this subject, you absolutely are. The tour you've just given us would suggest otherwise, Ali. I kind of feel like you've got to... The, the thing about the past is you've got to learn from your mistakes, you've got to learn from the past, but you've also got to look to the future. So you've always got to have... I always think you've got to have half an eye on the past, half an eye on the present, and a whole eye on the future. Mm. And, I, and, and with the Grand, it certainly taught me that, because every time I've wallowed too much in its past... I've forgotten about the modern aspect to it. I've forgotten about the fun aspect to it that young people need. So, But in, in regards to its past, so it was built in 1900. And the reason why it was built was because the people that were behind it at the time were putting on variety shows in a venue that's only t- two minutes down the road. And they were selling it out. It was the function room above a piano workshop. And they were selling the shows out and they realised there was an appetite for variety on a much larger scale. It was at the boom period of variety, which was almost, sadly... At the same, if you were to say there was a point in history when variety probably lost its way, it was when people started building big venues like this to put it on in. Because the minute something becomes that mass popular, there's been a cultural shift to make that happen, which inevitably means that it can't get any bigger and it can only go one way. After yeah, that. yeah. Um, so they they built the Clapham. They took a what was an old hunting lodge called Crosby Lodge, which is on the corner of St John's Hill where we are now, and they built the Clapham Grand, which. It's no mean feat to suddenly build a, at the time, a 3,000 capacity <laughs> Victorian theatre. They raised, the, obviously, Dan Lino was involved in it. He was obviously one of the most famous variety performers of his time, like a modern day Eddie Izzard or Michael McIntyre or someone of that ilk. Um, uh, so they, they raised the money, they built it, and they, they then took over running it. And I think they probably ran it successfully for about two or three years, but they were, it was very much like it caught the. You know when things are on the cusp up and, and it's just about to do that? Yeah. And then obviously you, you find that um, World War One happens, which probably didn't help anyone mm-hmm. at all, anywhere. And then theatre and cinema took over. So it, it kind of um, was a variety hall, but just when music hall became variety, I mean, so it was that, that cultural shift when mm. it went from being in function rooms above pubs or, or like workshops into being what were kind of replica theatres, but for people who didn't have as much money to go to the theatre. But it was unsustainable, I think, to put on that kind of entertainment in buildings this big Mm -hmm. for a long period of time, especially when cinemas happened and then TV happened, let alone when the bloody internet happened. Yeah. Um, So it went very quickly from being a kind of upmarket music hall to being a variety hall, and then it became a cinema and it was at that period of time when cinema and variety had like a hybrid model. So you'd have movies shown with variety performances either side. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it became a straightforward cinema when people were like, I really don't want that person performing. I just want to see the film. And films stopped being 40 minutes long and became Hollywood in length. Therefore, they didn't need to pad them out to make them more fun. Not a full evening It out. was 90 minutes to 120 minutes anyway. And then it was... Uh, it stopped being a cinema and became a bingo hall. Mecca Bingo owned it for the majority of the 70s, which, if, if anything, saved it. Because mm-hmm. most music hall variety theatres of this generation got knocked down in the 70s or burnt down and weren't rebuilt or got redeveloped because they weren't yet listed. But because it was trading as a bingo hall, it was functioning throughout the period of time when most of its kind of like contemporaries would have closed. And then it got listed status. And then when Mecca exited and no one took the building on, no one could do anything with it because it was listed. And in the 80s, which I find so bizarre, considering how many amazing parties were thrown in the 80s, mm. we were closed. Yeah. So yeah. no one danced to Wham on a, in the Clapham Grand. Oh, but they're dancing to it now, but Ali. They're making up for lost time now, <laughs> exactly. And um, we, so we were closed for the 80s, and then in 1990, a guy called Vince Power bought it, who, if anything, he saved it really because he turned into a live music venue, and in order to do that, he had to sandproof it. He had to do a lot of work to re- restore some of the brickwork and some of the fixtures and fittings. He he hated the fact that Mecca had butchered it. So when Mecca came in, they put false ceilings in, and they obviously didn't care about the history of the building. They just wanted to create a functional building, uh, bingo hall. So Vince Bauer came in, and from what I've read, and I've never spoken to him about it, we work in the same industry, but he... 
I don't he he hasn't reached back out to me when I've reached out to him to talk about it. I think he lost a lot of money mm. right on mm-hmm. it. Um, in fact, I know he lost a lot of money. So that's probably why he doesn't want to talk to me about it. Because to him, it's not a happy memory. <laughs> it's a sore subject. <laughs> yeah. It's a sore subject. <laughs> we won't ask him to come on. No, the we platform. won't. We won't. Um, but he did a lot of, repaired a lot of the damage that had happened from it being empty for the 80s and from Mecca Bingo having it. So he fully refurbished it and traded it as a live music venue mainly for seven years. And it had some amazing gigs. I mean, I was coming of age musically in the early 90s so I caught the end of Nirvana and then became a Britpop fan and if I look back at some of the classic gig posters you've got Courtney Love played here wow the Manic Street Preachers played here Suede played here um the Pogues played here Nick Cave played here Susie and the Banshee so the 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 caliber of talent that played here in the in the 90s from the live front was incredible but he couldn't make it work as a business model so he for whatever reason sold it and it was bought by Weatherspoons. Yes. For twenty four hours. And they owned it for twenty four hours and bought it presuming they would get the planning permission they needed to turn it into a big pub. And no sooner had they bought the lease than they then real they then got denied the planning permission. So they were basically sat on this building having purchased the lease but couldn't trade it. So they ended up having to get rid of it. And were they denied that because it's a listed building? Yeah, I just for whatever reason they just presumed they wouldn't have the issues that they had trying to get the planning permission. So they thankfully never became a Weatherspoons. And the current owner picked up the lease. He who still owns it today, Howard, who's an absolutely diamond guy. He was from kind of like slightly more of a cheesy clubbing West End background and turned mm-hmm. into basically a really high end Vegas style nightclub, which the photos looked phenomenal mm-hmm. and traded it like that for quite a long period of time when you know, if you had a license till three o'clock and you had a fun club night, you had a business model. Yeah. And obviously as things change and cultures change and people's expectation level on nightlife goes up and secret cinema came out and people started doing immersive things and pubs got late licenses, which meant that if you had a DJ in a pub for 200 people, those 200 people were no longer leaving the pub to go to the club, which meant that you could no longer trade as a 1250 capacity nightclub with just the DJ because Mm. suddenly... Fabric was spending 10 grand on DJs and your local pub had a license till three with Jimmy the DJ for 200 quid. So suddenly (laughs) this huge, big vacuous space that Jimmy the DJ would have been playing at can no longer put 1,200 people in it. And I then kind of, it was around that era that I stumbled upon it, putting on a bingo event that I was running, which was Rebel Bingo, which weirdly turns out you came to i came to on a 150 pounds bloody quid <laughs> that must have been the jackpot it was definitely the jackpot for us and we were like absolutely buzzing there That's was four hilarious. of us though we split it we split it four ways i think we just bought more drinks with you it you probably just bought pounds. more drinks Wait, when, when was this how do you divide 50 by five <laughs> well, I think I think so. <laughs> that's like you do the max it's 10, isn't it well i think we probably just invested it in Is the it rest like of the night 11 50 or something like that yeah something we invested ridiculous. it in the rest of the night and it was a fabulous night well, anyway thank you, thank it was so much fun and i think it is that thing of again the variety and what what's so interesting when you're talking to me is just how entertainment changes when the culture changes yes and i think for us like we went to that bingo night as it was kind of a bit ironic really like oh god what we're going to this bingo night and actually it was just so much fun and it had everything it was wilder than like us going to a club Mm -hmm. yeah and i think I think that's exactly what you've like bottled here. And it's so interesting here. And every, every time it's changed hands, it's been because of the culture has changed and the venues, people that have been running it have managed to, to keep it going, which just isn't happening with many other theatres. I think, I think that's exactly it. We, we, um, it's quite weird that you talk about bingo really, because if if it was bingo that saved the venue in the seventies, because without Mecca bingo trading it, it would, it would have been sold and it would have been redeveloped. In fact, I know that before Mecca bought it, someone wanted to turn it into a petrol station. Um, (laughs) I'd love to have seen how that would have, I'm just imagining, would there have been a petrol pump on the dance floor? I don't know. know It worked. Um, (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so Bingo saved it in the 70s. And then when I took it over, it's because I was putting on Rebel Bingo in here. And, and Rebel Bingo, sadly, is no... Well, it is. it still goes on, but the guy that ran it, me, we kind of realised that it wasn't going to be a full-time job for me forever. It was a bit of a lifestyle choice, to be honest, putting on a bingo event around the world. But 
hell you're allowed to do it in your 20s, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I think you can still do it now. I think you can. Yeah, I mean, like, we used to go to Vegas and New York just to play bingo, just to put on a bingo event. And it was like kind of like just because you could, not because it made business sense. Right, okay. But if you can go to Vegas to put on a bingo event, you're gonna, then why wouldn't you? You're going to go then to Vegas to put on a bingo event. Anyway, doing bingo here... It's kind of metaphorical. It saved it in the 70s and it was what put loads more people back in here again in 2015 when I started working here. And we still now do Bongo's Bingo, which is every Friday, mm -hmm. which is one of the biggest and best nights we do. So it comes full circle, So it comes it? full circle. And what, but what's beautiful about Bingo is it's just an old form of entertainment that's mm. just been made modern. And it's not like anyone's reinvented the wheel with it. Obviously, what makes Bongo's Bingo brilliant is because Johnny Bongo, who writes the show, who's developed the concept, is, is, is a really funny, creative chap. Mm. And he's managed to find the nuance that makes it accessible and fun for people. But the reality is someone's calling numbers <laughs> and you're marking them off. And if you mark the numbers off that are called out, you win a prize. Yeah. And that's not genius mm -hmm. for us. Whoever invented bingo is a genius. Yeah. Like in fact, whoever <laughs> invented bingo, and I think it was an Italian, it stems from Italy. It's absolutely mind-blowing how smart it is because... Mm. There is nothing more adrenaline-like than chasing numbers around a page when someone's calling it out. Oh, I know. And, even the, and you kid yourself that you think you're talented because you're... Yeah. The, the reality is... I've only got one number left. All like you're, you're really doing special. is listening to a number and marking off. And you're not even in charge of the numbers. But the adrenaline of doing it is what makes it exciting. And then the fact that you think that you've won because you're brilliant, but the whole thing <laughs> is a game of chance. I thought I was brilliant when I won my And there's also... Pounds. There's one... That every bingo card has the same numbers on it like every bingo card has got yeah. one to 90 in a different order within the things so it's it's, it's nothing to do with skill you mm -hmm. anyway but it's timeless mm -hmm. and that's what entertainment is it's the the appeal of being entertained we want to be entertained we want to laugh mm -hmm. we want to do it in a social environment especially when you're young um and the stakes are so much higher when you're in a group because that, like when you were describing like Fortnite before, that to me sounds like a Roman Colosseum. Like yes. all these people yeah. just together watching these, you know, like get like computer games and who's going to win and who's the champion and, and you pick a side. And it's just, that is so primal, isn't it? Well, what Even was, though it's online. What's funny about you say it being kind of primal is that like the, <laughs> not wanting to stereotype, but the audience of people that, play online gaming although obviously it's becoming more and more crossover now in fact the audience of the final league of legends globally on the internet is around the same as super bowl it's up it's there insane with isn't the it? super bowl in terms of viewers insane. it's just those viewers aren't in state in a stadium and on watching it on satellite tv mm. they're at home watching it on computers so it doesn't mm. quite feel real but anyway the audience of people that are still that are gaming at the moment when you when they come in in the queue and then they come and sit down mm -hmm. they're the quietest Love, loveliest people and they're, they're quite they obviously are quite they have social inhibitions which is why they mm -hmm. play online yeah quite yeah a lot. yeah but when the team is playing and i was in the office here all i could hear when someone obviously when someone was getting shot to pieces or whatever was happening in it the roar coming up and uh millie who works in the bar was nailed it and she was like it's so interesting because they they're the release that they're getting mm. when they're watching the game, you'd have thought they were a load of like England fans. Mm. But when they come up to the bar to get a drink, they immediately regress into like, <laughs> yeah, thank meek, you, please, meek and mild, thank you, yeah, please. yeah. But the minute they <laughs> sat down and the guys shooting thingy with whatever artillery they've bought off of thingy, and and it's like, <sighs> and um, again, it just comes down to timeless entertainment and sh the shared social experience, and that's what I'm fascinated about. And that's why I love the job I do. And that's why I love the venue because I don't see many venues of its ilk that are still doing that for young people. Mm. Um, I know you've done an episode on Wilton's. We have. Yes, we have. And I, 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 I used to live in East London. I used to go there and I think it's a beautiful space. And I think what they've done there is great. But for me, it's a museum. A modern representation of what someone thinks something looked like 150 years ago. But the problem with when you do that is you you romanticise the past. Mm -hmm. And because it's like a museum, you can't let your hair down in it. Like, I go to Wilton's and I'm like, I don't want to touch anything. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised it hasn't got signs on the wall saying, you know, when you, you walk around like an archaeological mm -hmm. yeah, thing yeah. and it says, do not things on, with a, taped with off do things. not touch yeah, it. Do not touch. And I, and I love the fact it's preserved and I love the fact it's beautiful and I'm jealous of the budget that they have to make it look this, that and that. Mm -hmm. And the signage is amazing and it's incredible. But... I wouldn't go to Wilton's to have my 
thirtieth birthday party. Yeah. 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 And I wouldn't I wouldn't have the third glass of wine that might lead to the Jaeger bomb. <laughs> that will lead that to the Jaeger bomb. That might lead to the confetti drop on Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse the Heart <laughs> at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but I feel like its audience then are grown ups. Mm-hmm. It's a grown up mm-hmm. audience. Yeah. It's a very creative arts based audience that want to be educated as well as entertained. 75% education, 25% entertainment. Yeah. Whereas the clap and grand is the third glass of wine. It's mm. the cheeky Jaeger bomb. It's Bonnie Tyler at one o'clock in the morning screaming your lungs out. It's 75% entertainment, 25% education. And your um, audiences, I imagine, don't know what the lineage is of the space or what they're part of nope. or anything, but they are they are part of it. They're just having a lovely time. And I think when people first came to, when people would have come here in 1900, they didn't think about the history behind the lineage of the entertainment. They just came here because they wanted no. to get sloshed. No, yeah, exactly. Like, they wouldn't have been thinking about where it was going to be in the future and... The or fact what, that it was part going to be part of history. They didn't think about any of that. They just came to have a good night out. Yeah. And I think that's what that's really what it's about. It's, you see people I mean? go in there and go, like as you say, go in there for a completely different thing. Whereas this is living, breathing, yeah. uh, variety. Exactly. But I need to find a better word for it because this is, that doesn't work. I'm trying to think. I know. No, I mean, there's got to be. There's got to be another. My word. girlfriend coined party party palace. Party palace is and great. I actually think it's great. I do think it, the clap and ground a party palace. It, I do kind of like it, but I would. I'm not sure if that brand would get misread outside of just for young people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we're from Liverpool, and obviously, have been to Blackpool many nights out, and I feel like there's many party palaces in Blackpool. It sort of like oozes that feel, doesn't it? Yeah, the party definitely. Palace, and definitely. It, yeah. I would love a night out in Blackpool. Oh, it's the oh, best. It's you have the best. To come. I imagine it feels like um, downtown Vegas. Have you been to Vegas? No, no. <sighs> but we've been to Blackpool. But Ali. We've been to- <laughs> Well, there you go then. <laughs> it's like <laughs> potato, potato. As I've said, I've, I'm lucky enough to have been able to go to Vegas for work. Work, in inverted commas. And you've got the strip, which is kind of like, you've got Celine Dion will be there and whoever the comedian is that made the Eiffel Tower disappear and mm-hmm. all these people. Mm-hmm. And it oozes money and everything works and everyone's getting shipped around in limos or Ubers that pretend they look like limos for people that really shouldn't be affording it, but they're just spending <laughs> it on their credit card. <laughs> and it's kind of like, it's fun and it's garish and it's loud and it's good for a couple of nights. But you kind of feel a bit like you need to wash yourself afterwards. Like you feel a bit <laughs> sullied by like... Yeah, you couldn't live in it. You couldn't, couldn't live, live in, in that. But if you go to downtown Vegas, which is like, used to be Vegas before Vegas moved to the Strip. Mm-hmm. It's basically where all the old casinos are where the light bulb, not all the light bulbs work. Some mm. of the neons are broken. Yeah. Instead of having, like, um, instead of having Celine Dion, there's a dwarf Celine, Celine Dion. <laughs> yeah. This is sounding exactly <laughs> like Blackpool. Like, but you do need to wash after you've been on a night out in Blackpool You do, well. but not because you're, not because you feel a bit soiled because the amount of money you've spent oh, and right. that you've been living a lifestyle that you actually can't afford because you, you do, because you actually need to wash. Because yeah. you've got dirty. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, yeah, of yeah. the grease off of the... the off of the bucking bronco that you were on. Yeah, and the heart attack inducing burger that yeah, was yeah, sold yeah. to you because it, they wanted you to challenge you to eat it. And the like, onions smelt so nice and the as you onions, walked past. And you probably chatted up a stripper in a bar and like all of these seedy things that are actually the organics of... Yeah, of where you are, of the, the environment. cheeky night out as opposed to pretending you're playing blackjack in a casino... And you've got loads of money when you really don't, you're going to regret spending that money. You go to downtown Vegas, there's a casino called the, the Golden Nugget, where they have a shark in a. I mean, I'm, <laughs> animal rights activists probably hate it, but there's a shark in a swimming tank over the top of the casino and it just swims through. Oh and you can, you, can, you can go on a flume that goes through it without actually going into it whilst you're gambling. And I think that's hilarious. the next thing you should get installed in the shark, the shark circle, an like overhead the, shark, an overhead shark, <laughs> <laughs> um, or I, just Mike in a fin. I mean, to be honest, I'm surprised that the, 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 there isn't already one. I'm surprised that wasn't part of the tour. This is the Shark Tank. Shark Tank. This is like the only thing you haven't got is a Shark Tank. There is a outback room. I haven't shown you the courtyard yet. That um, I call the Elephant Room. <laughs> because there used to be a cir- we used to do host circuses in the twenties when circuses were a big thing and you'd have like a, a herd of animals 
that they would be living, they would park up in like some field somewhere and then they would herd them up St. John's Hill into the Grand to do a show. Obviously, it was horrendously bad for the animals because they conditions were awful in the 20s yeah. for any travel yeah, circus. Yeah. But I tell people it's the elephant room because it just, it's, it looks like it should be some kind of farm room. But the reason why I say the elephant room is the, the, the connecting route to it is via an alleyway that's one foot wide that takes you to the street. Wow. So... And most people believe me when I say it's the elephant room because then there's a circus here. It's where we kept the elephant. But I'd have just walked them up an alleyway that was one foot wide. And then I just look and go, just, uh, how did the elephant get in the room? And they go, what? Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. It sounded funnier when I say it to people. I say it on <laughs> no, I love it. But I would love to go to Blackpool because I think it's got that aesthetic. Absolutely. And it's a little bit of what I kind of want the grand to embrace. Well, it's one of the only places as well that's still got all those theatres, the variety theatres still going. Yeah. You've still got, you know, the end of the pier shows. You've still got the, the hot ice show, the pantos. Like, it's still... I mean, Strictly goes every year, mm. doesn't it? Someone you know? once described my entertain my sense of humour, and they said, the problem, problem with you, Ali, is you're, you're a little bit too end of the pier for me. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, that's exactly that's what exactly I want to be. That's exactly what I am. And I'm not right with that. But I just think that the adjective of tacky has got such a bad press. Like, everyone thinks it, thinks of it as a negative thing, or it's really tacky. I love tack. Uh, I think we should. Re I think tack should be really embraced. I just think people need... To, I mean, I think it is happening now as well. It's like, there's a room for a stuffy night out, and there's mm. room for that big West End theatre experience or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But ultimately, I think, just, you know, put an inflatable dinosaur on yes! stage. Yes! Play yes. some pop music. Well, we've all been stuck inside for so long, haven't we, as well, that I think now it's like not about being cool, it's just about let's have fun. Yeah. Let's all get together and be fun. Mm. I just think, I think there's, there's something in... I've often pitched the Clapham Ground as being like the Royal Albert Hall held together by gaffer tape <laughs> or it. the Barbican for a tenor. And it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like... The, the events come from uh, have heart and passion and they are well produced within the budgetary confines you get when you can only charge a tenner or something to come mm -hmm. into a show. Um, but they aspire to be taking place in somewhere where you've got a £100,000 budget and the tickets are 80 quid. Yeah. And as long as we maintain the ethos that you're trying as hard as you can, but ultimately you know you can only operate within your means but it's still fun and people can tell that it's been well thought out and passion's gone behind it. And I think that's kind of the sweet spot, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. And I've, I honestly feel that is where variety was anyway. And musical mm. was people cared about it. They did it to earn a living, but there was no pretension that they were going to become huge global. I mean, no one even could yeah. become a global star at that yeah, point. It obviously, didn't exist. obviously, you know, you, you had um, Marie Lloyd and then you had Dan Lena himself. And then obviously Charlie Chaplin went, global into movies so there was that shift but before that opportunity arose it was about doing as many shows as possible in the same night like yeah. and could you go around the country doing it and mm. you had your act and it was probably a cover of a song that someone else did but you yeah. just did a different version of it that became really popular um or you had this you were capable to wear really long shoes that made it look like you had big feet and yeah you or you were just really small or <laughs> you were you you were he had a hairy face and you were female so therefore that was your thing you know and um, i'm sure there's parts of music hall and variety that were completely and utterly awful and inappropriate and massively wrong but of its era that's what happened and um what blows my mind as well is that the recorded music never existed so you Absolutely. couldn't listen to music. There was no radio. Mm -hmm. There's no music radio. No one had released vinyls yet other than probably classical music, if mm -hmm. my knowledge is correct. So in order to actually hear a song that you liked, you had to pay for a ticket to watch someone perform it. So everyone would have performed versions of the same song. And it was whoever's version of the same song was more popular or more funny or appealed to the most people would make that person popular. Mm -hmm. So imagine living in a world where... If you wanted to listen to a song, you had to pay to go to a venue to hear someone sing it. I, I can't fathom that. No. Because you can't I just take put, it home. I just you? put it on my iPhone. Exactly. Well, we were saying this about um, the episode we did about Mari Lloyd, where we said that the amount of people that showed up for her funeral when she died, they had, she had, they had processions of people she in the street. She was a superstar. A superstar. Yeah. And you think those people can only have seen her live? Yeah. They, she was a superstar. 
of that era, Dan Lino was a superstar of that era. And so many of them were, but it's just like, imagine living in a world where in order to listen to music, mm. you had to go and see someone sing a song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mad. And totally. But that's why they were all here. I mean, we were talking about capacity before yeah. and you were saying that even just in the upper gallery, there was a thousand people, yeah. which what's the capacity now? Uh, 300. 300. So yeah. you, the difference like in the, the conditions and the atmosphere and the fact that a thousand people were allowed up there, yeah. just it got people out the house, didn't it? If I'm allowed a moment to be proud of what I do, I think that the, th- the thing I'm most proud at is that Or the thing that I have most respect for in entertainment as well is the fact that no matter how many things have come along that have created the experience to be able to consume entertainment in a different format, whether it be cinema, television, the internet, it's ultimately the grand is still providing that for people en masse to have that social experience. Mm -hmm. And we're creative with our programming and we realise... what because. The pressure on the business to run a business that requires to make seventy thousand pounds a week to break even, that that, that is mind blowing amounts yeah. of money yeah. for an independent venue that has one owner that hasn't got the benefit of being able to operate as a chain like the theatre groups have or the cinema groups or even the the O two Academy groups who can, you know, cost effectiveness of starving staffing because everyone can work across multiple venues and you can route tours because you can promise seven dates to someone. Like mm-hmm. we are one venue with one independent owner and independent team. And we have to be creative and we have to program correctly. And we work with some really great creative people that have great concepts and shows. And I feel like no matter how many obstacles are put in your way to stop that being plausible, it's still plausible. And you don't get it in theatres. You mm-hmm. don't get it in gig venues you don't get it in cinemas or anywhere like that because they are always one dimensional with their programming but we yeah. have all we are i mean it go we are a modern palace variety. of variety and i can't escape the word and i just wish yeah. there was a way to make it accessible but i feel like maybe maybe it's kind of like it's for the people that know yeah and yeah. as long as your product is fun for the people that don't know what variety means, it's kind of okay. Mm. They're just coming and having a good time. And that's why it triumphs, isn't it? Over, like you say, the internet, cinema, yeah. COVID, you know, all these obstacles that get put in its way. Yeah. And yet it still manages to come out on top. Yeah, I think there's just something beautiful about a load of people having fun, and mm. be, getting a bit drunk and having a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've talked just now about loads of famous variety performers. Who are some of your favourite variety for- performers? God, I was thinking about this question the other day, actually, and I had a really, really, really good answer, and I've forgotten who it is, because it's, I don't, I have... They're that memorable. I have, they? no, but, like, I have, <laughs> there are so many people that I admire. I don't really look back at any historical variety performers and say they're my favourite, because I don't particularly, I don't actually find that entertainment funny, because it's a different lifestyle to yeah. me. It's a different thing. I can, un- I understand where it comes from, and I understand why at the time it was good, and I think when you start getting to Charlie Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy, it becomes more accessible because mm. it's on TV and it's made for film. But when you look at the really old footage of a variety performer from 1900, I get it, but I don't find it funny. And when people do modern representations of it, I can understand why it's good because they're talented people that do it. As I'm, as I'm sure with your own act, you are great performers, therefore your performance is great. But if you don't like that style of entertainment you're not necessarily going to enjoy it but you can admire why it's good so I don't really have that throwback to those people I think in the modern era Peter Kay I think is hilarious and he is very he is in the lineage of those era of performers he is a variety-esque performer definitely Eddie Izzard Mm -hmm. again you could draw parallels with him but then I also love Noel Fielding I thought Mighty Boosh was kind of off the wall genius and they Mm -hmm. were comedy rock stars yeah if you see of their era yeah um liam gallagher is a personal hero of mine i think he's comedic i think he's a singer but he's also a personality he's a comedian he's not just a one-dimensional singer in a rock and roll band he's a life force in his own entity yeah and people like him because Mm. of that yeah i guess i guess i couldn't give you one i think you know some of my favorite comedians peter k just has me absolutely has me in pieces but then he created Phoenix Nights as well, which is that working man's club which, variety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all comes back, Which is sometimes it? what I, I feel the grand has moments of being. <laughs> it, it has elements of that, which I, which I absolutely love. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think, you know, 
anyone that makes you happy and laugh and inspires you and can move can 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 move you in a in entertainment i think is admirable i I have a huge amount of respect for anton deck Mm -hmm. yes yeah like what a career Mm -hmm. and they are saturday night tv they Mm -hmm. are you know they present britain's got talent they have they sat anton deck saturday night takeaway right that as a saturday night live show in here that's what it is they've Mm. taken the concept of a of a variety show but have made it suitable for telly and i think as a tv it's genius i think they are geniuses and they are modern variety performers and they've kept it clean for its family show as well it's a family show but they're cheeky with it you know they Mm. they are they can sing they can dance they're funny they're smart they can produce they are they are variety performers they are music hall stars that have made it onto the big screen if I think about the performers from the Grand's current programming who are who I draw parallels with with variety performers, and some of them don't even know it because some of them aren't engaged in the heritage of what they do. They just do something because they enjoy doing it. You've got Myra Dubois, who is a... She was on Britain's Got Talent a couple of years ago, actually. Yeah. She, Gareth Joyner, who is the, the human behind Myra Dubois, he... He, he, she is incredibly clever and very, very funny. And I can see direct parallels between her and the lineage of performers that come from the past. One of our hosts here is a lady called Lucy Baker, who is in a Jesus and the Sisters, where she plays, a, a, she's a female bearded up as Jesus. And then she has two <laughs> nuns who are actually twin sisters. And I can't describe their comedy other than it hits my sweet spot of being (laughs) like niche slightly weird a bit rude taking poking fun at the establishment and religion and all the things that sometimes deserve to be have fun poked at them but in a light-hearted way and but she's one of the funniest people i know and she deserves to be on tv she deserves to be famous but Mm -hmm. not everyone gets that break but Mm -hmm. she's brilliant um but i don't know obviously you'll probably follow rupaul and drag and Uh and all the rest of it so Bag of Chips, Mm -hmm. who was one of the drag queens on Series 1. But before she was on Series 1, she'd been a drag queen in Soho for for a decade, if not longer, playing all the Soho... I remember seeing her when she was brand brand new. Yeah. Brand new on the scene. And and so everyone... Obviously, RuPaul makes people believe that nothing happened in drag before RuPaul, Mm -hmm. and you've got to be on... It's like... Suddenly, it's like the X Factor for drag queens. and, And anyway, but she... Just one of the funniest people. And when she... She can sing... She holds a tune, she can drink, she can cuss, she can, <laughs> obviously it's a guy in drag persona. But when she's on stage and she's singing and it's rowdy and leery and rude, but in a forgivable way, and she's drinking on stage and they're asking, she's out doing a downing a gin as a competition and she's doing modern, she's doing like rude takes on modern songs and that whole concept of what she does, that to me is probably the closest I've seen to a Marie Lloyd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, and, and yeah. It's classic, it's timeless. Like she would have been on like a 1950s TV show mm. in, as a drag performer and would have been a TV superstar in the 50s. She would have been funny in the 30s. She mm-hmm. would have been successful in 1900. And she's timeless now. And she did a brunch for me and she she just performed for an hour and a half. She yeah. was only meant to do 20 minutes. She stood yeah. there and, and captivated the entire audience. It was on the South Bank in summer. And the audience just grew and grew and you had your ticket holders. But then it was about 2,000 people that just came and watched because she was funny. And what's yeah. interesting with drag is when you read about variety performers and music hall stars, they had to do as many shows in the same night as humanly possible. Mm. So there would have been horse-drawn carriages taking Marie Lloyd from doing sometimes up to five shows a night in London. Now, if I book a drag queen now, I have, I'm on my Uber I am booking, yeah. scheduling Ubers left, right, and centre, and the Uber is now a London hackney carriage, mm-hmm. and a drag queen mm-hmm. is now a variety star or a yeah. drag king or a drag queen or any drag performer at the moment because they are the, the performers that are in vogue. And you are literally shuttling these people from the Clapham Ground to the Royal Vauxhall Tavern to the Two Brewers to Bethlehem Green Working Men's Club to a bar in Soho. And they're like, yeah, I'll do a show for you, but you're going to have to pick me up here and get me off there and I've got to be there at this time. Yeah. And if you're the poor venue that's got them last in those run of five <laughs> venues, sod's law, they're going to turn up late and they're going to be smashed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But so will the audience. <laughs> but so will the audience. And I find that, um, that parallel with it so incredible. Like 121 years of change of mm. history has happened. Mm. God knows how much has happened in the last 20 years. It's changed the face of entertainment, how we consume it at home, on TV. There was four TV channels when I was at 17 years old. 
I had a party to celebrate Channel 5 with my mates. <laughs> I remember. We had a Channel 5 Spice party. Girls yeah, it was rubbish. <laughs> Got smashed. And now, the, how many channels? How many things yeah. can you watch on the internet? How mm. many games can you play on Twitch? How much stuff can you be bombarded with to distract you at home, to never make you leave the house? Mm. And yet, bag of chips is earning a fortune, and rightly so, by going around and being funny. Mm. and singing and engaging people and bringing people together and taking the piss out of someone and levelling life and going, who cares who you are? I don't care who you are. You've had a shit day at work. You're going to have a great night tonight and yeah. I'm going to take the mick out of you. I'll take the mick out of your mate. I'll take the mick out of everyone. But you're going to sing, you're going to dance, you're going to cry with laughter, mm. you're going to drink too many drinks, you're going to eat some beige food, you have too many hot dogs, you wake up tomorrow morning and you'll have had a bloody lovely time. Yeah. And that, and that is kind of like, it probably feels like I'm wrapping it up here, but that feels to me like is what is, what is um, beautiful about it. And no one's going to pay £25 a ticket for that. And no one's going to make me a Hollywood producer. And no one's going to employ me to book the Palladium. Because that's not what those venues do yeah. to get by. Yeah. But I feel like with the Clapham Grand, that's where this is as big as you can do it mm-hmm. before it becomes financially impossible <laughs> to sell tickets to a Bridget Jones movie night for a tenner and make a profit no matter yeah. how funny your amazing host is. And that's kind of what I, what I like about it. Well, we've it talked does. about you being a producer. So, talent Can aside... Can we please call that incredibly loose? Oh, an incredib- you're an loose. incredibly loose the term, producer. The, the term. Because when you say I producer... I love that. Incredi- when, you turn, incredibly when you say producer, producer, it makes me think that I've got, like, a costume department and a wardrobe department. You have! We've just seen it downstairs. You've just taken us into the basement. There was laundry world! (laughs) There was laundry world. And there's furniture world. And I love those worlds. You've got stationery corner! Who has... What more? Do you want Cameron McIntosh? Individual labelled containers of every single itemised bit of station you could need to put on the show. The organisation in this room, listeners, is... Off the scale. It is. You can't function with that organised station. <laughs> so if you weren't an incredibly loose producer, talent aside, if you could work in the variety world in any capacity, what would you love to do? I mean, Eric can be as incredibly loose as you like. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I would love to have been a performer. I would love to have had the confidence to be on stage to host something or to sing, but I can't sing and I don't have the confidence to do it which is probably explains why I do what I do. Um, I think in terms of other venues, aspirationally, like I love the Royal Albert Hall. I Mm. I, I just think it's an incredible space. I think the Palladium is the halfway between the Clapham Ground and the Royal Albert Hall. I remember there was a night a couple of years ago whereby Madonna played the Palladium and we had... Yes, she did. A good friend of mine, David Robson, put on a Madonna party as Mm. a tribute to Madonna with some amazing performers doing Madonna turns. We had the London Gospel Choir. We had Margot Marshall, who's a great, great drag queen. Um, But it was not Madonna. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? And it's like, Palladium had boys own. We had boys life, (laughs) which is Brian McFadden after he left Westlife with Keith Duffy from Boys Own performing as a duo, (laughs) singing all their songs. And I was like... The Palladium has the real people. We have either the ex-members of the real people or pretend people. Mm-hmm. And it's the Vegas Strip and the Vegas down, downtown Vegas mm-hmm. similarity. Whereas the Royal Albert Hall, it's like, it's just the Royal Albert Hall, man. Like, mm-hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. What a space. Yeah. Purpose built for entertainment. Amazing sight lines, amazing acoustics. Mm-hmm. I book myself in for backstage tours sometimes just because I just want to walk around the venue. Mm-hmm. Um, Radio City Music it's a bit more art deco it was built in the 30s i'm not a big fan of art deco personally as a style i don't like it but i find it a bit too pretentious but as a venue it's incredible signage is great backstage is great they've got their own dance team the raquette the uh the raquettes yes yeah their their dance troupe they do a christmas show every year that runs for like 80 dates twice a day just licensed to print money i'm incredibly jealous Mm -hmm. of its success (laughs) um and I have backstage tours of that venue. Whenever I go to New York, I just book myself in for a backstage tour because I want to walk around the dressing rooms. I want to see how it functions. Yeah. Like, like, how do they operate? Yeah. Um, but I don't, I, don't really, I don't really have job envy, if I'm honest. Mm. Like, I, 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 don't I think like, I do now of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I've got job envy. I, I don't like it when my job becomes stressful to the point I can't enjoy it because yeah. it makes me angry that I'm not enjoying this thing that I feel like I should be blessed to do. To have so when I get too bogged down in the in the pain of 
it's not pain, but the pre- the pressure of it is quite tough, and the operational headaches. And when I get too in that world, I find that I lose my touch of the thing that makes it silly. So we've got to bring back the silliness sometimes. And obviously, as I get older, it's harder to. You know, you just get older, don't you? So you, do you want to be in somewhere with loads of drunk people at three o'clock in the morning anymore when you're 40? <laughs> it's like, you know, you have to try to, well, I need to find someone else that does then or you need to try to find that thing around. But I don't I don't really have job envy. I sometimes have budget envy, if I'm yeah. honest. That was lovely. That whole thing was like a mantra, that, mantra. Ali. I think we need to re-listen to that every time that we're feeling a bit unmotivated. I have sign envy. I want a downward neon sign that says the grand, that's visible, side on as you walk up and down the street mm-hmm. but the powers that be in boring world Ooh, of health and safety and all that rubbish you're allowed to do that what's the reason behind that because of light pollution right. like it, it will obviously project a lot of light into the street but there's the rules and the the application and the planning process behind it and the cost attached to it would far outweigh oh, the benefit yeah. of me doing it so basically i just put it in photoshop post it on socials every now and again and make it look like it happens and that's fine keeping everyone nice and safe we, we used to have a book in the office actually of, of like of events that we've kind of promised to do or things that we've put on a facebook event that we actually can't remotely action <laughs> uh, then you have to like edit it quickly before the event go oh, it's definitely not possible we're not allowed to do that we're not allowed to do that and sometimes these ideas bleed out and you put on an event and it sells no tickets and you realize that you need a reality check inside the room to stop you making that event an actual thing, like to control your brain. Mm. Because when Bruno Mars attacks, the Mars Attacks movie night hosted by Bruno Mars impersonator, Uh sounds hilarious. It does. The artwork was brilliant. No one wanted to go to that. (laughs) (laughs) Because people are like Mars Attacks, niche B uh-huh. movie type vibe. They're generally and not speaking, the people that like Bruno Mars. That, well, they probably like one song, but mm-hmm. they definitely don't want to pay to see a Bruno Mars impersonator. I reckon I'd I probably would. fall I, into those both. I camps. definitely would pay to see Bruno Mars so attacks. What you would do is you would click attending on the Facebook event, tag each other in it, and go, "This looks lols," but no way on earth <laughs> buy a ticket, right? <laughs> and we did it here. Well, one of the first things we did when I first started working here with a, a wonderful lady called Linda who worked on it with me at the time. And it was definitely one of those situations where someone at some point needed to turn around and go, this event is funny in your brain. Mm. Yeah. But no yeah. one wants to buy a ticket. <laughs> and the truth was no one bought a ticket. There was 30 people that came in for free who sat there and watched Mars Attacks and got very confused in, in when we paused it halfway through to put on a Bruno Mars impersonator <laughs> who sang a cover of Uptown Funk. And oh, no, this is before Uptown Funk. So this isn't even Uptown Funk or Bruno Mars. This is like, I can't even remember what his early song was. But anyway, and then held a flying saucer competition between two members of the public who, who had no idea why they were doing this thing with Bruno Mars, who looked like a really bad Bruno Mars. Uh, no, that's really bad. If he's listening, you were great. <laughs> you were produced badly. Anyway, that didn't really work out. So who comes up with the um, ideas for the show? Is it collaborative? Is it you? Like who? Because, I mean, we've got the board in front of us here, right? So what's coming up just in November? We've got um, the drag race final and then we've got boxing. So the thing is, at the moment, our programming is very much driven by external promoters and it's their concepts and ideas uh-huh. because the pressure behind selling tickets for your own shows or, or that kind of thing when we need to be as safe as possible and make sure we're putting bums on seats. The venue at the moment has become very much a home for other people's shows because it's less risk because they're going to pay a higher fee. And they're selling the tickets, not you. Mm-hmm. So it's their show. Obviously, I still try and make sure that we create a diary that looks fun and silly and all the things that embody the venue, but we're doing it on someone else's dime, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Because reopening after COVID, I needed to make sure we had six months worth of events that were going to be tickets were going to sell rather than us take too much in-house but you know two or three years ago we were doing all that really fun silly stuff and it would have been you know it'd been the the dark recesses of my mind would have come up with something at like two o'clock in the morning when I was sat at home and Mm -hmm. yeah just random inspiration random random times that's when the best ideas come out jokes I remember do you remember when everyone thought Uber was going to close down and there was that oh yeah (laughs) so we we did the final ever Uber party (laughs) And a, a friend, but no one could get home. A friend, yeah, no one could get home. And a friend of mine called Jono has a has a little club night that he runs where they, um, it's called Mini Cab FM, and it's basically all of the soft rock songs that you get played in taxis that take you home. <laughs> so we had him program the private bar upstairs, and then we just played party bangers in the main room, and had a, like an Uber themed cocktail. Um, 
it's that kind of stuff that, that you do or like you go right we're going to do we're going to do a movie night but we're going to then make the club night afterwards themed around Mean Girls so it's going to be a, a fetch mm-hmm. so fetch will be the club so night fetch. and all that kind of silly stuff well br- if, if a 2am epiphany isn't Bruno Mars attacks then nothing is exactly is it but it, 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 <laughs> it, you know I'm going to go back to what I said before it, it, it is probably not far removed from what was going on 120 years ago with someone going well what can I do to make my act different mm-hmm. well I'll do a pastiche of that. Mm-hmm. I'll, yeah. I'll change the words to that or I'll do it in costume or I'll do the silly version of the thing that someone else has done serious and that'll be why people will like it. And it's kind of what we do now. It's like, I'm not rewriting the rule book, certainly not producing a show from scratch and casting it and writing a script and any of that stuff because that's I can't do that. Leave that to the people that produce proper shows. <laughs> yeah. I can just make things silly and funny and accessible for people that want something silly, fun and accessible. And do you know in advance, like when you put something on like Mean Girls, I mean, I guess Mean Girls is kind of like mainstream and cult at the same time, same with something like Rocky Horror, but is it the more cult, the better, or is mainstream better? It's amazing you've asked me this question because I'd forgotten to talk to you about this. I've come up with the concept of Breesh, <laughs> right? Love it. There's Breesh, and then I've got to get this right, and Nord. So Breach is niche and broad. 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 And Nord is niche and broad. Yeah. I like Breach. And if you I like so do I. So ba- basically, it's kind of like Mamma Mia is broad. Mm-hmm. Yes. But everyone likes it, which means it's popular enough that people buy tickets for. Mm-hmm. But it's also in the West End. It's also a film. It's also ABBA themselves. It's very broad. So if you do it, you can do it, but... You, but you're kind of competing with mainstream people as well. Whereas a film like The Never Ending Story is cult and niche, mm. but it's cult and niche enough that there's enough people that will buy it mm-hmm. to sell enough tickets. Yeah. Therefore, it's breach because it's breach. niche but broad. I love it. And I generally find here it's, it's finding that sweet spot of something that is either going to be broad but no one knows it yet, Or it's niche, but with a big enough cult audience that people Mm. want to come and be entertained by it. Whereas if it's either too niche, it's just niche, therefore it's not popular enough, or it's... Like Bruno Mars Attacks. It's the wrong combination of broad and niche, therefore it becomes Nord, like Bruno Mars Attacks. So if it's Breach, it works. If it's Nord, it's because it didn't work. And that's my get-out-of-jail card. I love this. So it's finding... So I think you found a new word for variety. Breach. 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 There it is. We've done it. We've actually (laughs) solved the mystery. Equally as unappealing as a word to say that you're into. If I'm honest with you. That's so breach. That's so breach. But Mean Girls is a prime example of that in that it is niche, but it's big. It's got Mm -hmm. got a huge cult following. People that love it, love it, know every line. it's not quite... It's not Titanic. It didn't break box office records. Yeah. But you will it's got bigger over time because yes. of probably events like word what you're doing. Or mm. WOM, yeah. W-O-M, word of mouth, which is the best way to sell tickets is yeah. people to talk about something and it'd be great. And it's, it's those things. It's pop cultural. It's connected. It's got an element of nostalgia. It reminds you of a period of your life that was great that you want to revisit, but it's still modern and fresh so you don't feel like you're living in the past. Mm. Nostalgia can be really bad because it can be too much about the past. And I think, as I said earlier, you've got to, be, think about the future as well as the past come to the Clapham Grand you'll have an orchestra play with a bearded Jesus as the host and we'll fire yes. confetti and you'll play paper aeroplanes with your hymn sheets and you'll have mulled wine and we'll serve you pigs in blankets you can buy 20 of them in a bucket with a fork <sighs> covered Roll in gravy Christmas. and you'll have a fishbowl cocktail of, some, of God knows what and you'll have a bloody wonderful time and that yeah that's it I think that's a great place to wrap it up. I do. That sums it up beautifully. Well, we have to do our quick fire round. Fish bowl or a bottle of wine with a straw in it. I mean, I'm going to go with a bottle of wine and a straw because I just think it's funnier. (laughs) Why mess around with having four glasses? Just have the bottle. You're going to drink it all anyway. Nirvana or Oasis? Every time, Oasis for me. Abba or Queen? Abba, every time. Mean Girls or the Rocky Horror Show? Rocky Horror Picture Show every time it's so bizarre it's brilliant it's my favorite yeah no it, it's, it, it's 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 the incredible. film version of the clap and grand as a film it's yeah it's the yeah, yeah, yeah. Show, without a shadow of a doubt confetti or glitter confetti the, the perfectly timed confetti drop is a thing of is magic a, is a magical moment mm. that 
no one else can do in the room, whereas everyone can throw glitter at themselves. But firing that <laughs> confetti drop, like watching it go, when you haven't told the, the performer that they're going to get a confetti drop and the audience don't know it's going to happen and you time it to perfection is brilliant. There's a, there's a comedic red button that you press to fire the confetti. And we sometimes include... Like the presidents in the White House. Exactly. And we, we sometimes... <laughs> it's, like, it's, like the, uh, it's like that with confetti. And we sometimes give it away as a prize the, to fire the confetti. Oh! And that's that that is a bingo prize, that's a I'd prize. win. So we, had, we gave away a box to the Masioki event last, we, last month where they did... It was Masioki Sing. And this girl who won it, she was so nervous... Because she, she liked this red button. She was so nervous when she did it. But then when she fired it, just her face, just ecstatic. The Greatest power. moment of her life. That moment, creating that magic, guys. To Amazing. fire the confetti at the Clapham Grand. Well, I should have got, re- about, should have got her a t-shirt. I fired the confetti at the Clapham Grand. What a t-shirt that would be. I feel like they're the only t-shirts that aren't in the building, to be honest. They, they We've seen should, so much. Should be the only t-shirt in existence. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has just been a fabulous. joy, total I hope, joy. I hope I haven't rabbited you. Oh no, not at all. Good luck editing we, we it love down, a good rabbit. I loved that interview. I loved meeting Ali. I thought it was really refreshing to hear somebody who is still working to keep Variety alive, even though he says he isn't, but he is. We know you are, Ali. We know we've got your card marked, Ali. And. Just a really, yeah, fresh perspective on the world that we love so much. A perspective that you might almost call breach. <laughs> Me and Mike have used that so much in our lives now. We're like, is this niche or is it breach? So I love, I love this song. It's a bit breach, isn't it? It's a bit breach. And we've discovered that we just generally are quite breach. <laughs> so what have we got coming up next week, Mike? Well, we've got a real treat for you next week. We have got part two of our fantastic interview with the amazing Michael Beer and Marion Sinclair, former primas and founders and principals of the London City Ballet. And in the next episode, we're going to speak to them a little bit more about the history of the London City Ballet. The conception, the growth, the way it flew and became a really, really successful company. And all about their royal patronage. Absolutely, which links into a couple more things we've got coming up, but stay tuned to hear more about that next week. And we really appreciate that many of you have got in touch and told us how much you enjoyed part one. So please keep your comments coming in. We love to hear what you're enjoying, what you want to hear more of and get in touch with us. And remember, if you've ever got something that you think that we should be covering in this podcast, we would love to hear from you guys as well. So please get in touch with us on Frame This Presents on Instagram and Frame This Presents S-O-L-P on Twitter. All that's left for us to say is... See you next week! As they were quite... <clears throat>